Lecture 11, The Goddess and Her Devotees. The worship of female deities has a long history in India and today remains one of Hinduism's prominent religious features. In the Indus Valley civilization, numerous female figurines suggest that women were accorded a sacred status by virtue of their capacity to nurture new life. The Vedic pantheon as well contained several goddesses, such as the dawn, Ushas, and the important personification of speech, Vach. It is true that during the Vedic period, male gods like the Macho Indra were in the ascendancy. In later classical and medieval Hinduism, however, the worship of the goddess came into its own and regained a central place in popular religion. Today, Shaktism, the worship of the goddess, is regarded as a major Hindu religion alongside Shaivism and Vaishnava. In this talk, we will study the Hindu conceptions of the goddess and examine some aspects of her iconography and worship. When speaking of the divine female in India, it is common to refer to the goddess in the singular. This is because all particular goddesses are forms of Devi or Mahadevi, the great goddess. In myth and in worship, there are countless goddesses, which are often treated as distinct deities, particularly at the popular level. Just as different gods represent the one god, so the different goddesses manifest the one Devi. Ultimately, of course, Devi and Deva symbolize the transpersonal Brahman. Although the name Devi is commonly used, more frequently she is known to devotees as Mata, Ma, or Aman, all various ways of saying mother. Interestingly, however, none but a few goddesses have children, and those who do have children acquire them through unusual means. We can classify the many manifestations of the Devi into two broad categories. The first is the category of consorts, those goddesses who are the wives and companions of the great gods. The second group comprises the independent goddesses, those who are not associated with male divine figures by way of marriage. A goddess's relationship to a male god determines her basic character. Those who are divine consorts are seen as benevolent, gentle, and life-giving. The independent, unmarried goddesses are malevolent, terrifying, and lustful. This difference will require some explanation. I'll start with the female consorts. Each of the great gods of Hinduism is married. Brahma, the creator, is married to Sarasvati. Shiva is married to Parvati. Vishnu is married to Lakshmi. We can also mention the consorts of Vishnu's avatars. Rama is married to Sita, and Krishna's consort is Radha. In temples, the male gods rarely appear without their female counterparts. I'll explain the reason for this practice shortly. But the goddesses, even the married ones, may appear without their husbands in temple icons. For example, Lakshmi is not only Vishnu's wife, she is also the goddess of good fortune and wealth. At the start of a new fiscal year, business persons commonly worship her and pray for prosperity. The Devi Sarasvati is almost always worshipped alone and never with her consort Brahma. Sarasvati is the goddess of music and education. Brahma, despite his status as one of the three cosmic deities, has very little role in popular Hinduism. Temples devoted to him are extremely few. 
Sarasvati, on the other hand, is very important, especially to students. She's often venerated at school festivals and prayed to before tests. I often wish that I had become acquainted with Sarasvati when I was a student. Unlike Lakshmi and Sarasvati, Parvati is usually not worshipped alone, but usually together with Shiva. In mythology, Shiva has many different wives, such as Uma or Manakshi or a host of others. They can all be viewed as forms of poverty. Shiva's wives were probably local village goddesses that were incorporated into Shavite religion as it increased in popularity. The consorts of Vishnu's avatars are revered mainly for their relationship to their male counterparts. Sita, the wife of Rama, is considered the ideal wife because of her fidelity and obedience to her husband. Radha, Krishna's consort, is the image of the devotee with a passionate love for God. The relationship between the goddesses and human women in Hinduism is very complex, but at least in these two instances, the female deity is regarded as a model worthy of emulation. The independent goddesses are another matter altogether. It seems quite clear that they are not considered divine exemplars of femininity. It would be a mistake, of course, to assume that the goddesses and the gods are necessarily, by virtue of being divine, images of the ideal human life. The goddesses and gods are different from us, no matter how much like us they may appear. The goddesses who are independent and autonomous often appear as celestial deities like Vishnu and Shiva. Many of the myths about the Devi depict her engaged in activity akin to that of the other great male gods, such as protecting the cosmos against powerful demons. Sometimes she is portrayed as accomplishing difficult tasks that the male gods cannot. The great Durga Puja, celebrated in Bengal, is a nine-day affair that memorializes the victory of the Devi as Durga over a powerful buffalo demon. This is one of the most popular festivals in Hinduism. The celebration is based on a story that tells of how the gods were too impotent to defeat an army of demons and begged Vishnu and Shiva for assistance. But Vishnu and Shiva themselves were unable to control the demon army and had to create the goddess to do so. Thus, Durga was born from the combined anger of these two great gods. Durga proceeds to defeat the demon's leader after a long and vicious battle. And after her triumph, she promises to return whenever the demons prove too powerful for Vishnu and Shiva. The most terrifying form of the Devi, however, is Kali. Kali, like the ascetic Shiva, haunts the cremation grounds. She is black, fierce, fanged, and fond of blood. Her hair is disheveled, and she wears a necklace of severed human heads. Theologically, Kali reveals that life is inherently painful and that life often feeds on death. In the not-too-distant past, human sacrifices were offered to Kali. At a Kali temple in Tanjore in South India, human sacrifices were performed on Fridays up until the 19th century. In the late 18th and early 19th centuries in and around Calcutta, a group known as the Thugs, was known for committing crimes in the name of Kali. They often murdered innocent victims by strangulation as a sacrifice to their patron Kali. The thugs were often respectable men who held regular jobs during the day but served the goddess at night. Although the British banned the thugs in the 19th century, their name lives on in the English language 
as a synonym for unsavory and brutal criminals. Although human sacrifices in honor of Kali have by far disappeared, animals are regularly offered to her at the Kali Ghat Temple in Calcutta. Nonetheless, animals are only a substitute for humans. The Puranas say that the goddess is pleased for a while with the sacrifice of goats or buffaloes, but a human sacrifice pleases her for a thousand years. Even today, there are sporadic reports of human sacrifice or self-immolation in honor of the goddess. The autonomous goddesses were and often still are associated with the outbreak of epidemics, especially smallpox, the disease that has ravaged India more than any other. Epidemics are frequently believed to be the result of the goddess's anger directed towards a particular village or district because the villagers have neglected her. There are innumerable local village goddesses, and many of them are smallpox goddesses. When epidemics occur, deity worship intensifies. Still today, many Hindu villagers will refuse to take smallpox inoculations because they believe the goddess has a greater power to prevent the disease, and to submit to human science would be to anger her. The contrast between the independent goddesses and their married female counterparts is striking, and it is a difference that has not gone unnoticed among scholars, especially those working in the area of women's studies. A common explanation for this difference is as follows. The rage to which the goddess is subject derives, in essence, from her childlessness. Without children, she is seen as not having fulfilled the central role of the female, childbearing. Hindus do not deem it appropriate for the goddesses and gods to have children, except in a few remarkable cases, since children would suggest a loss of immortality. The view implied here is a common one in the history of religion, that children are what humans have instead of immortality. Perhaps it is ironic, then, that Hindu women seek help from the goddess to have children. Being childless and perhaps sexually frustrated, the goddess's pent-up emotional energies are easily triggered and directed towards those who might upset her in the slightest way. It is therefore in one's best interest to cool the goddess's ardor with appropriate gifts and offerings. What might motivate a Hindu to choose such a deity to worship. Perhaps this hymn, written by Ramaprasad Sen, a 18th century Bengali poet and devotee of the Devi, can illuminate this point. Sen writes, Though the mother beat him, the child cries, Mother, O oh mother, and clings still tighter to her garment. True, I cannot see thee, yet I am not a lost child. I still cry, Mother, Mother, all the miseries I have suffered and am suffering, I know, O oh Mother, to be your mercy alone. In such a view, the sufferings one endures in this life are regarded as the chastisement of an ultimately loving mother to whom one clings in all circumstances. Perhaps, too, we might sense in this hymn an appeal to the goddess to manifest her compassionate nature by subtly reminding her of it. Being childless, the married goddesses are also subject to the propensity of rage, but their relationship to male gods keeps them cool, as it were, channeling their anger into nurture. Now, perhaps this theology sounds blatantly stereotypical of a patriarchal society, 
that believes, to quote the laws of Manu, that a woman is never fit for independence. Yet, there's also a relatively complex understanding of the divine nature that supports this view, one that is not wholly stereotypical. In this understanding, the female aspect of divinity is considered its creative and activating power. The word for this power is shakti, and it is the root word in shaktism, the religion in which the goddess is worshipped as supreme. A devotee of the goddess is called a shakta. Shakti is the active principle in Hinduism, not unlike what the Chinese call yang. But whereas yang is associated with the masculine, shakti is feminine. The masculine principle, or shiva, and this is used with a small s, is by contrast passive. In fact, the masculine principle is so passive as to be dead. Shiva without shakti, says an old proverb, is a corpse. Male gods thus require goddesses to empower and enliven them. And this is why, in the temple images, the gods are usually accompanied by their consorts. The indispensable nature of the Shakti is suggested in a macabre image depicting Kali dancing on Shiva's dead body. This idea is also suggested by the goddess's red forehead marking, as contrasted with the white forehead marking for the gods. Red is the color of power and energy and heat. White is a cooling color, often associated with death and ashes. While the goddesses are essential to the functioning of the gods, at the same time, goddesses require passive gods to give form to their dynamic power. Without form and restraint, the energy embodied in the goddess can become dangerous. Thus, we witness the fury of the independent goddess. With too much restraint, though, the goddess may become too passive. So it's for this reason that we find both the dependent and independent form of the goddess in Hinduism. There's one other striking difference between the gods and goddesses, and that is their realms of activity. In general, the gods are seen as celestial, and goddesses are terrestrial. Although the earth is the stage for many of the gods' activities, the link between earth and goddess is much stronger. This connection is shown in many ways. For example, the earth itself is a goddess. She is named Budevi, literally earth goddess, or more loosely, Mother Nature. Rivers are also goddesses, such as the Ganga, uh, as rivers, the Devis nourish the world with their water. The entire land of India is a goddess, Bharat Mata, or Mother India. There is a temple in Varanasi to Bharat Mata, and rather than an anthropomorphic image, it contains a map of India. In a previous talk, I mentioned the story of the self-sacrifice of Sati, the wife of Shiva. After her death, Shiva dropped parts of her corpse all over India, and each portion consecrated a temple of the goddess. These temples are named for the particular part of her body that fell on that site. And earlier in this talk, I mentioned the countless village goddesses that serve as local patrons of small communities, especially in South India. There are decidedly local deities, her powers are generally limited to the boundaries of the village. These village devis are usually worshipped alone and stand alone in their temples and shrines, but they might also be considered as consorts for Shiva. It's important to men mention one final manifestation of the goddess. This is the embodiment of the devi as actual human women. Such incarnations of the goddess are not uncommon. For some, an especially powerful woman, such as Indira Gandhi, one of India's prime ministers, might be regarded as the goddess in flesh. 
Sometimes the incarnation is a less well-known woman who is believed to personify the qualities of the mother goddess. The classic film Devi by the great Indian director Satyajit Rai is a poignant study of what happens when a family patriarch becomes convinced that his own daughter-in-law is the goddess. Closely connected with the worship of the goddess is a large collection of writings called the Tantras, which were composed in the medieval period. The texts are essentially technical manuals for how one might attain liberation and enlightenment through dedication to the Devi. The yogic practice of Tantrism, or simply Tantra as it's often known, is based on the techniques described in these writings. Tantra practice has become relatively well known in the West as a manner for improving one's sexuality. There are even books and workshops offered in Western countries purporting to teach paying customers how to increase sexual pleasure by using tantric methods. Now, whether or not these practices are authentic tantra is debatable. But it is clear that the purpose of Hindu Tantra is not physical pleasure, but spiritual bliss and enlightenment. Yet, as certain varieties of Tantra seek to attain this happiness in unconventional ways, uh, including sexual ritual, Tantra has gained a reputation that is either tarnished or intriguing, depending on one's personal interests and values. When Westerners think of Tantra, they usually think of what is called left-handed Tantra. So-called right-handed Tantra is a worship practice that is not altogether unlike the worship of Vishnu or Shiva, although the Tantric form emphasizes the repetition of a special mantra given to the initiate by a female guru. Both varieties of Tantra are open to male and females of all castes and operate independent of Brahminic authority. Tantra has had an especially strong influence on the development of Vajrayana Buddhism, the dominant religion in Tibet. It is considered by its practitioners to be an advanced form of yoga. One must master other yogic practices before attempting Tantra, else it can prove dangerous. I always remind my students at this point that they should not attempt to practice Tantra at home. Tantra is best left to the professionals. What many find scandalous about left-handed Tantra is what others find intriguing. It, that is, its ritual use of certain things that are ordinarily forbidden to Hindus. These elements include the eating of meat, the drinking of wine, and sexual intercourse between partners who are not married to each other. Tantra is not the casual practice of these activities, but their deliberate usage for the purpose of enlightenment. Tantric rituals are practiced in a sacred space in the presence of a guru on a specific, carefully determined day. In the first part of the ritual, both male and female participants ritually bathe, dress, and apply cosmetics. They undergo ritual purification through meditation and mantric recitation. Male-female couples then form a circle around the guru and the guru's partner. The female partner sits on the man's left, which is the traditional position of the goddess relative to the god. This is how the practice acquired the name left-handed Tantra. Then they ritually consume the meat and the wine and eventually end with sexual union. Before each of these activities, mantras are pronounced to consecrate the elements. Otherwise, it would be highly polluting. Mantras are recited to sanctify the woman as the goddess. Sexual union, then, is envisioned as a form of worship and devotion to her as Devi. There are numerous accounts to explain the purposes for these practices. Perhaps the most basic 
is that is the, the account that argues for directing human desires towards liberation rather than repressing them. This philosophy argues that trying to deny certain desires only empowers them further. Rather than repress potentially harmful impulses, Tantra tries to harness them in the service of salvation. Ritual provides a controlled and highly structured context for indulging forbidden desires. In addition to ritualized sex, it is argued, this practice serves to awaken in participants an awareness of the non-duality of the world. Duality, that is, thinking in absolutist terms of yes and no, or black and white, good or evil, is precisely what keeps us from realizing the identity of Brahman and Atman. These activities in Tantra are meant to break down the conventional dualities that we have constructed, the falsely opposed realities like clean and unclean. To awaken this awareness by bodily as well as intellectual means is a tremendous aid on the path to enlightenment. Along these lines, the aspect of ritual sex is regarded as the reenactment of the cosmological union of Shiva and Shakti. Deva and Devi need each other. Shiva without Shakti is a mere corpse. Shakti without Shiva can be overwhelming. In this ritual, the male is enabled to appropriate the active feminine powers, and the female can appropriate the passive masculine powers. Dualism is thus transcended. A final theory explains how tantric yoga arouses the latent energies in what is called the subtle body. This conception tells of a vast power source that resides near the base of the human spine, coiled up like a serpent. Hindus call this resource the kundalini. Enlightenment can be attained by stimulating the dormant kundalini energy and allowing it to flow through various centers of the subtle body called chakras. Chakras are power centers in the shape of lotus flowers that lie along the spine from its base to the top of the head. Releasing kundalini allows energies to flow upward, causing practitioners to realize oneness with ultimate reality. Worship of the goddess and tantric yoga are two ways in which Hinduism greatly differs from the mainstream religious traditions of the West. Some Westerners, however, are coming to regard these Hindu religious forms as embodying some things worth embracing. Some have argued that the masculine gods of the Western religions ought to be balanced with a more consciously appropriated feminine element. Others see value in viewing the body as a source of revelation and truth. Whether or not the Western traditions will ever find a place for the goddess, as Hinduism has, remains to be determined.